Gamecock fans, I really don't know how else to say this. If the SEC goes to a nine-game scheduling model, South Carolina is going to be the biggest loser in the entire conference. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and also the lead staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you all so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch here today. You can find the Locked On Gamecocks podcast both on YouTube, and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. And before we get into this Wednesday edition of Locked On Gamecocks, I want to let y'all know that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. SEC administrators and head coaches alike are all currently in Destin, Florida, for the SEC's annual spring meetings. And this year's meetings could have massive ramifications on the future of the SEC conference, mainly regarding their future scheduling model, because the SEC is going to do away with divisions after the 2023 season, so they've been debating between a 3-6-6 or 9-game conference scheduling model or a 1-7-7, an 8-game conference scheduling model and here's what i will say if the sec decides either in 2023 or 2024 to go to a 366 or nine game sec scheduling model south carolina is undoubtedly getting the shortest end of the stick here because their future strength of schedule is going to be completely out of their hands due to their conference schedule and their rivalry with the clemson Tigers. Now, I'll explain my main point on the Clemson Tigers being involved in their strength of schedule in just a little bit. But to give you all some context, first of all, that SEC podcast host, Michael Bratton, did a show back on May 23rd and talked about some information that he was getting regarding where the SEC was leaning with their future scheduling model. And what he was told was that they are right now closer to eight games than they are to nine. And In terms of roadblocks to agreeing on a nine-game schedule, Michael Bratton said that one of those roadblocks was the stipulation on having to play one Power 5 team every single year. Because obviously, that would be automatically 10 Power 5 games for each SEC team that they would have to play on the schedule every single year, and that would make it infinitely more harder compared to other conferences. And I understand that point. But the thing is, if the conference decided to rid themselves of that stipulation, then it would not affect certain programs in this conference. It would make their path easier is what I actually mean by that. But for South Carolina, they really don't have any choice here. Clemson would not be leaving South Carolina's schedule because state legislators would absolutely get involved here. That's what happens when you're in bed with your state government as the flagship university of the state of South Carolina. There's just no question that they would do everything in their power to make sure the Palmetto Bowl is not ending. And I don't want to be misconstrued when I say this. I don't have an issue with the rivalry continuing. I don't want the Palmetto Bowl to end. But here's my overall point here. Other teams like Mississippi State, Arkansas... LSU, Missouri, teams that do not have out-of-conference in-state rivalry games like a South Carolina, a Florida, a Georgia, or a Kentucky, they would be able to schedule whoever they want and probably throw a lot of fluffy cupcakes into their schedule to offset their already strenuous SEC slate. Teams especially like Florida and South Carolina facing two ACC heavyweights in Clemson, Florida State, They're not really going to have any option here. They're going to be held hostage by the SEC, whose commissioner wants the conference to go to nine games 
every single year. And there's state legislatures who will undoubtedly take these things to court if there's a possibility that the rivalry game for that state could go away. There's just too much riding on it, not just from a state pride standpoint, but also especially an economic standpoint. For South Carolina, that being in the Midlands surrounding the Columbia area and also even in the upstate where Clemson is located. So this would give other SEC teams an unfair leg up on South Carolina in terms of of trying to win championships, not just the SEC championship, but also try to make it to the college football playoff. Think about Kentucky, for instance. Let's say they were like Mississippi State and LSU and the other teams I mentioned, and they could throw whatever three games they would like to. You know that Kentucky would schedule probably two MAC games and an FCS game with a team from Indiana or Ohio. Now, how would that stack up compared to South Carolina having to play a nine-game conference slate like Kentucky, but in this hypothetical, South Carolina's got to play Clemson as one of their non-conference opponents. And again, we all know there's no way it's going away. Does that sound fair to any of y'all? Of course it doesn't. So, because of this, South Carolina, their road to winning championships would become much more difficult on multiple fronts. Not just the fact they have to play a ninth conference game, which, if it doesn't happen this year, I would imagine it's going to happen sometime down the road because money talks, let's be honest. And you are not going to see the Clemson game go away. Again, I know that probably no one wants to see that Clemson game go away. I don't want to see it go away. But we cannot deny the fact that having Clemson on the schedule just inherently makes the road more difficult than it does for the majority of the rest of these teams in the SEC, who are all going to undergo the same circumstances as South Carolina now, where they got to play everybody throughout a four-year span, both at their own home stadium and on the road. But South Carolina has Clemson at the end of the day. And it's not like South Carolina is scared to play Clemson, but again, both things can be true at the same time. You're not scared to play Clemson, but it's going to make the road way more challenging compared to other programs. That's not fair to South Carolina. Now, if this all unfolds this way, if we do end up eventually going to a nine-game conference schedule where all these factors begin to come into play for South Carolina, there is a way that the SEC could make things right for the Gamecocks in regards to their three permanent opponents in this 366 model. And we're going to dive into that a little bit further in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. But first, today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel throughout the NBA Finals, which are starting on Thursday night. New customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, which means that you'll get $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not go through. On Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the Miami Heat, the eighth seed of Miami Heat, will go on the road to take on Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets. The Miami Heat are currently nine-point underdogs, and the money line for the Heat is listed at plus 310 for Game 1 of the NBA Finals. If you think that the Miami Heat is going to bounce back from the long series that they just had against the Boston Celtics, then put some money on them covering the spread. If you think Jimmy Butler and Caleb Martin are both going to go off once again, then maybe bet on that money line. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Welcome back to today's edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Before we continue today's show, real quickly, I want to thank all of you everydayers for making the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast your daily choice for South Carolina Gamecock sports coverage. Okay, so if the SEC decides to go with a 366 or nine game scheduling model, Concern the fact that South Carolina, one way or another, is going to be playing Clemson every single year in the non-conference portion of their schedule, 
How could the SEC make things right for South Carolina, who would undoubtedly be a little bit behind in terms of fairness compared to other teams both on the same tier as them and teams even at the top of the conference? Well, here's what the SEC could do. They could give South Carolina three permanent opponents that will be easier to navigate compared to all the other teams. And that's all going to depend on how they organize the teams in the conference. In my opinion, I think that the best way to do it would be to go through a hypothetical tier system for all the SEC teams. So basically, just put five teams in a tier one, tier two, and tier three. So tier one, you might have like a Georgia and an Alabama and say LSU. Tier two, you might have a Florida Tennessee, and an Auburn. And then Tier 3, you might have teams like Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, Kentucky, so on and so forth. And from the list that I compiled, the best tree of permanent opponents to balance out playing Clemson every single year for South Carolina would be the trio of Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Admittedly, right now, if you put Clemson up against all the teams in this conference, they would be a Tier 2 team with the potential argument of being a Tier 1 team. So it wouldn't be fair for South Carolina to have to play a Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 team based on the teams that I just threw out there. It would be a lot more fair to the Gamecocks if they had to play, say, two Tier 2 teams, and I think that Florida and Tennessee fit that criteria perfectly. When looking at Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky, it makes sense for these three teams to be South Carolina's permanent opponents in the SEC for a couple different reasons. First of all, they are all in close proximity with maybe the exception of Kentucky. South Carolina and each of those teams can travel to each other's venues very easily. It's not going to be supremely complicated like it would be if, say, South Carolina had to go to Missouri one year or if a Florida had to go all the way out to Texas or Oklahoma. It would be a lot easier for all these teams to just play each other because of how close they are in terms of distance. The other thing is they all are very familiar with one another. All these teams play each other annually at this current moment. So you're not creating any sort of new rivalry here and hoping that the teams are going to spit a little bit of venom between each other. That, you know, there's going to be some animosity between both fan bases. The SEC front office would not have to worry about that with Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky when they play South Carolina because for different reasons, all these teams, they do not like each other. They do not like South Carolina. South Carolina does not like them. So naturally, it just makes sense to have all these teams play together in that aspect. And then here's the other thing. South Carolina does not have any natural SEC rivalry. Let's be honest. If you're going to throw one of them out there, Maybe throw out the Georgia Bulldogs. But I follow that up with this question or questions. Do you want to play Georgia and Clemson every single year? You probably don't, or at least you don't enjoy it. Okay, well, let's say you have a choice. Would you rather play Georgia every single year and you can't play Clemson? Or would you rather play Clemson every single year and you can't play Georgia every year, but you do play them every other year. You would rather have the latter, right? Because you want to keep the Palmetto Bowl. You want the in-state rivalry to stay alive. So, it makes sense for South Carolina to play Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky instead of throwing Georgia in there. And then the SEC has really got to try hard to essentially just make up the difference. Maybe throwing in a Vanderbilt. It'd just be a lot easier to just go ahead and give South Carolina, Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And here's the thing. There's a possibility that this is indeed the group of three permanent opponents that South Carolina gets in a 366 model. Because Sports Illustrated's Ross Dellinger, who by the way does a great job with all of the work that he does on college football, he tweeted out a list back on March the 3rd of every single SEC team and future SEC team in Texas and Oklahoma, and three teams for each of these SEC members. And this was essentially a crack at who the three permanent opponents could be for each team. And for South Carolina, Ross Dellinger listed Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky, the exact same trio that I just talked about. And here was a follow-up tweet that he had to that photo. 
where he said, from speaking to league insiders, this is our best educated guess of the three permanent opponents for each SEC team if the league moves to a nine-game model. This is in no way official. So based on that list that Ross Dellinger did post, on South Carolina's end, it does seem like that the SEC is accounting for the fact that, look, if they go to nine games, they get rid of the non-conference Power 5 stipulation, and South Carolina, either way, is going to be stuck in the Palmetto Bowl and having to play Clemson every year because of lawmakers in the state, then they got to find a way to make it up to South Carolina, who, again, would be getting jobbed a little bit in terms of their overall strength of schedule compared to what other SEC teams are going to be allowed to do in that same regard. So there is light at the end of the tunnel for South Carolina at the end of this whole thing. The question is, are the men in suits who have no probable direct ties to South Carolina going to see it in the exact same way at the end of the day? We all have to hope that that's the case, because if not, then uh, it's not going to be impossible for South Carolina to win a national championship. I still fully believe that they can pull it off, but it's certainly going to be an even steeper uphill climb than it already is at this current moment in time. All right, now, while I ended our previous topic with a positive note, let's go ahead and continue this positivity to end today's show by moving on to the recruiting front for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. As there is an on three camp that is getting to take place, I believe, up in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't know exactly what they're calling their camp, but on three is hosting some of the best prospects in the entire country for the 2024 recruiting cycle. And that group includes the number one edge rusher in the entire country for this cycle in Dylan Stewart, a massive Gamecock target for this class. Now, Dylan Stewart talked with On3's director of recruiting, Chad Simmons, about some of the schools that are in contention for him. And when he was talking to him about South Carolina, he gave quite the eye-opening quote in his interview with Simmons saying the following, I like what Coach Beamer is doing. I see what he's trying to build, and I might want to be part of that. He's building a good program. Now, the thing that catches my eye in that entire quote, it's probably obvious to all of you here who are watching or listening to today's show, but it's the part where Dylan Stewart says, I might want to be part of that. I think that that is a big deal for South Carolina and for all the fans that follow recruiting because the thing is, to this point in the process, Dylan Stewart has given praise to certain programs. You know, obviously he's enjoyed his visits here at South Carolina and other programs as well. But I haven't really seen too many times where Dylan Stewart has sort of given a bit of a tease in a sense in a quote where he's mentioned the possibility of actually going to a certain program. Unless he's done that with maybe Ohio State or Georgia, this is the first time that I've seen him hint at the fact that, you know, he might want to come on down to X school and play his college football career there. And he did it with South Carolina. So to dive into this a little bit further, y'all, we've been talking about this for months now. South Carolina is the leader in the clubhouse here for Dylan Stewart. It all adds up. He has visited South Carolina more than anybody else. He has the longest standing relationship with Shane Beamer and this entire staff compared to Georgia, compared to Bama, compared to Miami, compared to pretty much almost every single school that has at one point in time been involved in his recruitment. They have had the best relationship up to present day. And yet, national recruiting analysts continue to seemingly kind of look over South Carolina and try to almost find other teams that they could point to and say, that's the team that's going to be the one to beat for Dylan Stewart. They better be careful doing that, because I'm telling you, once again, they're going to be surprised when Dylan Stewart ends up picking up a Gamecock hat whenever he signs, whether it's December or February. And just like Nicholas Harper, everybody's going to be sitting there scratching their heads going, we did not see this coming. When does South Carolina get in? South Carolina's been involved. They just put in all their work behind the scenes, and y'all just don't recognize it. So it's happening once again here with Dylan Stewart. 
And here's the other thing. Some people have interpreted this quote, admittedly, in a different way. There are some people out there that have hypothesized that based on the wording of Dylan Stewart's quote there with South Carolina, that he is trying to make a play for some more NIL money. And that is why he is basically saying everything short of, you know, South Carolina is my leader, which he has said publicly before, admittedly. But now it seems like he's not wanting to stick his neck out a little bit and say that at this moment. And there's no real issue with that, in my opinion. I don't think that you should interpret it that way. Because in my opinion, Dylan Stewart is just simply doing what any smart 17, 18 year old would do in his position, which is keep your cards close to the vest. Make some of these teams and recruiting analysts for that matter have to guess who leads for you right now. And that way, you'll be able to maybe see what everyone has to offer. If it is for more NIL, I promise you South Carolina, they would have no issue probably trying to come to the table with more NIL money. And here's the other thing. For the bozos out there on social media that don't know South Carolina's football program at all, maybe don't follow recruiting that well, that say, well, if it's NIL, then there's no way he's going to end up at South Carolina. Uh, again, ask Nicholas Harper. Ask Oregon. Ask Michigan. Ask them how that all worked out. Guess where he ended up in the end of the day? He ended up at South Carolina. Do you think South Carolina can't pull it off a second time? I'm telling you. These people from outside this state and outside this fan base, y'all, this is why we have such a great relationship. Me as this podcast host talking to all of you Gamecock fans because we understand this program. And we also can recognize what's going on unlike everybody outside of this state. We all know what's happening. We're not going to be surprised when Dylan Stewart ends up donning a Garner and Black uniform on game days in 2024. Everybody else will. And that just goes to show you, once again, South Carolina continues to do their work in silence. And you know what? Maybe Shane Beamer and company prefer it to be that way. With that being said, that's going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What are your thoughts on what a non-conference game schedule could do for South Carolina in terms of maybe putting them at disadvantage? Do you think that that combined with the Clemson game could give some of their SEC counterparts an unfair leg up on South Carolina. Do you think that maybe the three permanent opponents that I mentioned in Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky would be a fair way to balance all of that out? And lastly, what are your thoughts on Dylan Stewart's quote? Do you think that that means that South Carolina, again, is still in the driver's seat, or do you interpret it in a different way? No matter what your thoughts are, let me know down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube, or shoot me a direct message on Twitter at A-Line underscore SC. If you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app, once again, thank y'all so much for tuning into this show. I'm truly grateful to be the host of this podcast. And again, you all are what make this show possible. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. 